All right, so I can start now. Okay. All right. So I'm uh, I'm Javier Rivera, and I'm I'm super excited. I get to talk to you guys about Emil Sharon today. Um, just give you like a background. I am currently a student at the University of Arizona. I served in the military for about six years as a nurse. Um, you could say I discovered philosophy while I was deployed <laughs> and thinking about death and uh, suffering. Um, so, but my current major is I'm studying, I'm doing religious studies, but I'm actually thinking about switching it over to a PhD track on sociology. Um, with that being said, am I able to share my screen, uh, Julie? Yeah. Okay. Um, I said I can't share the screen. I know. Okay. <laughs> Again. All right. Does everybody see that? Okay. Okay. Cool. So my <laughs> my lecture today is is going to be what I call organic revelation. Emil Sharon is this Romanian French philosopher um, born around the twentieth century. Um, I really liked focusing on his specific illnesses and organic struggles that he went through because insomnia painted most of his life. Um, he could only write through this insomnia and was constantly depressed. Ironically, he did say that <laughs> forgetfulness um, was his only salvation or was our only salvation. And so uh, it's, I found it just super strange that he ended up dying um, having Alzheimer's. So in some sense, he did get uh, what he wanted. Now here's a couple of thinkers that I, I enjoy reading, uh, Eugene Thacker and Susan Sontag. Uh, I would say Thacker, the way Thacker describes Sharon is exactly the way I've encountered Sharon myself, where I just sort of stumbled upon him. I wasn't really actively trying to seek him in any particular manner. Um, and then there's Susan Sontag's description, which is exactly how anti-systematic he is. Um, he writes in a lot of aphorisms, which is what also made this uh, doing this presentation a little bit difficult because there's no systematic way to sort of break him down. I'm, I'm actually doing something completely counter to what maybe even Sharon would like or want. But anyways, I pulled out some themes that I thought were extremely interesting with Sharon. Um, and one of those kind of foundational ones is how he's influenced by Nietzsche. Um, my talk today about organic revelation has a lot to do with this exact quote right here with Nietzsche about how the self is the body. And I and my proposal is that I feel like Sharon really emphasizes this whole ideal about the self is the body. Now we all know Nietzsche was against Plato to uh, a lot of extent. Um, but what's interesting is that if you take Plato's kind of proposal about how we can't know the truth until after we die, mainly because we have a body and we have desires, I feel like Tron sort of attempts to answer, um, what do we do when we are in that situation? How do we deal with the fact that we have a body 
that we have desires? Is there a way to reach metaphysical revelation through having such a body? And so some of the three ways that he sort of proposes this revelation is through illness, despair, and, and death. But for Sharon, I'm going to propose that he sort of presents this inversion of Christianity where it's about falling, <laughs> but this falling is more about the rising um, towards non-being, ironically, for him. And so in order to understand suffering for Sharon, he looks at illness. And he both describes suffering and illness as lyrical virtues. And this is something I'll bring up later, but basically he wants, he's going to paint out this fall-like depiction drama between the abstract philosopher and then what he would call abs absolute lyricism. And so suffering and illness, because they have lyrical virtues, they're the very things that sort of generate knowledge. They reveal uh, the nothingness um, through death's imminence. So one of the first books that he wrote was Heights of Despair. And I sort of just try to break it down into exactly what that could mean when Sharon talks about the Heights of Despair. And of course, the height for Sharon is about being and living near this abyss, this nothingness, and then having a passion for the absurd, which I will go into the, on the next slide. But despair for Sharon is this state of anxiety and restlessness. Um, you, it's, almost, it's almost like a pre-theoretical zone. You can't have problems. There is no problems. Um, despair is something that is so internal that for Sharon, this is a mistake to think it's a problem to be solved or that it can be alleviated by external problems. It's sort of like a, a baptism of sorts, a baptism of fire. And so here, here's where he goes more into the passion of the absurd, where it has to do with this sort of wariness, this exhaustion of limits, of our bodily limits through illness, death, etc. And yet there's something still happening. It's almost like this sort of rupture-like transformation that is going on despite the exhaustion of, of limits. And so death for Sharon, basically there's only one fear. And for, for Sharon, it's always death. It doesn't matter what form that takes. It's always going to be fear of death. And then the ultimate conclusion for Sharon is that fear of death is always fear of nothingness. And there's nothing that you can abstractly do to take away that organic fear. Um, and so what I enjoyed about most of his book is the fact that he's trying to show that abstract man doesn't even understand until he's thinking with his body. And this is why I brought up Nietzsche in the beginning. Because I feel like he's really sort of honing in on this and expanding upon it. And not to mention how everything bears death and its imminence. So there's a couple sections where he sort of like disses on metaphysical, si metaphysical systems. And fundamentally, they're all rooted in some type of ecstasy or enjoyment, you could say. But if it is rooted in ecstasy, then it's rooted in the body for Shran. And that means this is a sort of pre-theoretical zone. And that this is why I said despair has to be a pre-theoretical zone, because he says despair is sort of required to experience ecstasy. And so the fact that ecstasy sort of roots for Sharon the, the birth of medical metaphysical systems, 
he's trying to look at how did that happen? How did that occur? And really has to do with the sort of despairing nature of reality. And that this sort of hell-like purification is the only thing that sort of roots our metaphysical systems. Now, what's interesting is when we start moving into themes of like suicide, for example, of what he has to say about that, for Sharon, there is no positive suicide. It's completely irrational. So this idea that philosophers try to claim that suicide is an assertion of life, for Sharon, that doesn't make any sense because it's completely irrational. And that we're sort of undermining the organic, the real organic fear of death when it comes to deciding to take one's life. Um, I'm currently taking a class right now on sociology of mental illness. And what's super fascinating is that they can only theorize so many factors and their most of their solutions surrounding suicide is just prevention. Um, they all have come up with sort of methods of constraint, right? You can't, you know, take away any kind of weapon or anything that could become a weapon. Um, make sure you have them promise that they will come to you and want to talk to you every time they start thinking about suicide. Um, and what's what's interesting from my own experience in the army is that suicide is still a huge issue that can't be solved. Like they're still trying to solve it. They're still trying to solve the suicide rates that for some reason can't be deterred. And so what's fascinating about Tron is this, is that there is no rational explanation to give for this kind of act. It's a sort of pathological attraction to death, as Tron calls it. And so when we look at all these types of abstract arguments that philosophers like to give, for Sharon, if it's not rooted in the organic, if it's not something that feels so irreconcilable, so irrevocable, as he says, um, then we're not really thinking because all of these questions have to eventually fall null and void, that we have no idea um, that we're just sort of eluding our, uh, you know, illusioning ourselves into the sort of idea that we're not falling into nothingness. And so this is the, this is his whole point about thinking that if it's useless speculation to be the abstract philosopher, only the organic thinker can come up with any real thoughts for Sharon. What's interesting to him is the fact that you have some type of nervous tick or some type of sickly disposition. He finds that way more interesting. And the fact that you have contradictions and sexual tensions, these all make it so much better to say something, to, as he says, transform your tears into thoughts. All right, so this next one is about time and eternity and what Sharon has to say about this. And basically the way Sharon understands time is through agony. The fact that life is just this long drawn out agony. And the only way you can experience or know the sort of imminence of death is through that dramatic unfolding of agony in time. And then we get this question of eternity for Sharon, where everything is swallowed up by eternity. He's actually trying to take the, the sort of nothingness seriously, or even this idea of salvation doesn't make any sense in the face of eternity. This idea that you can sort of strive for moral virtue, moral perfection, it, it doesn't make any sense for Sharon in the face of eternity. Everything is swallowed up in this sort of black hole of, of nothingness. 
And then there's this concept of absolute lyricism. And absolute lyricism for Sharon, as I said before, is this point where everything, you realize everything is sort of an act, an illusion, um, and everything starts becoming blurred and confused. Um, this, is, this is the fall that I was talking about, where you sort of begin with abstract man in this drama. And then you start falling down into like a dizzy confusion. Um, and so absolute lyricism is this point of absolute self-knowledge, but it's an absolute confusion. Um, and this is what marks the transition for Sharon for, from philosopher to poet. The other couple of things that I found interesting between time and eternity is that Eternity is only a moment for Sharon and the conquest of time. But it's a complete rupture. It's a complete detachment from all successive moments that this sort of dialogue around becoming and everything else is simply an illusion. But ironically enough, if you pay attention to what he's saying, if we take that seriously, that sort of agony that unfolds in time, what Sharon is trying to say is that you will sort of understand eventually what that eternity is in an instant as you sort of head towards nothingness. And so he says it right here. It can only be a sort of the conquest and void of life. So you're completely dead, uh, in my opinion. And so this, and because you can experience eternity, there is this sort of aspect where you are like a living dead. And so just to share my personal sort of attachment to Sharon right now is the way he talks about mystery and sadness. And I brought up suicide and how that isn't something that a lot of people are able to solve. And the only methods that they have come up with are constraints. There is something deeply more mysterious about what Sharon would call genuine sadness and how it sort of leaks into the mystery. But of course that mystery is just the seduction of, of nothingness. There's ironically uh, nothing there. It sort of lacks its organic um, touch. And yet ironically, it's the organic manifestation of our tears turning into thoughts transforming itself into this realization of rupture and instant that one can only experience through this sort of agony, death, and illness. So I know that's a little short, but I was curious if anybody has any questions and specific, uh, yeah, I was just curious if you guys have any questions about um, Sharon right now. Um, so, um, I guess um, not about Sharon, but you mentioned that uh, that the only methods that um, we've been able to come up to uh, deal with suicide on any sort of scale is um, the uh, prevention of prevention and constraining of those struggling with such thoughts, such as taking away weapons, locking them in uh, special rooms, or in extreme cases, even like uh, binding them if needs be. So, why do you think that is? Do you think that um, uh, uh, do you think that it's possible to find some way to uh, prevent suicides without risk? resorting to constraints. 
yeah, that's a good question. I mean, Sharon is very adamant about, he's sort of this ironic nihilist, but I, even I, I try to refrain from calling him a nihilist in a sense, um, mainly because of his, his has this position of just like nothing matters in the face of eternity. Um, I, I guess if you if you frame your question in the in the face of eternity, for Sharon it, it doesn't matter. Um, everything gets swallowed up in this, and even if and even if you commit suicide for Sharon, it's it's still just this pathological attraction. Now, the question that you're raising is it possible, maybe even through um, Sharon's method. I think it can be, I think it can be, but it would have to change, we would have to change the dialogue in, entirely. We would have to talk about, um, we'd have to sort of embrace more of these sort of negative afflictions like illness and sadness um, and sort of allow the mystery sort of to persist or exist or maybe understand that it is a mystery. Um, I can't imagine a sort of ironic conclusion with suicide where it's prevented precisely because um, we sort of embrace that mystery um, through embracing these negative afflictions. Um, but also there's this, I, I didn't talk about this, but Sharon actually brought up the idea of why he didn't commit suicide actually. Um, and so there's a double maneuver here where he says that, even he's sick of death. And so perhaps they would we would have to do a maneuver like that, maybe, um, where we're also sick of death, but we have to sort of go through the purification of agony, despair, and sort of experience the imminence of death to, you know, reach a conclusion where we're also eventually sick of it. It's almost like the prevention of suicide in dialogue now is under an abstract under an abstract sickness of death, you could say, um, when it's not actually a real sickness of death. Um, we have to sort of let the sickness be. It's, it's strangely enough, your, your question points to uh, <laughs> the way I think about when I was learning nursing, when they said actually a fever isn't necessarily a bad thing. A fever is sort of getting rid of uh, fighting off the infection. So if Sharon comes out not committing suicide because he's sort of sick of death, um, you could say he let his own internal temperature, his own internal sickness um, get rid of this. Um, yeah. Hopefully that sort of answers your question. That does, yeah. I have a question, but I don't know if you can see me. Um, so you can't see that my hand is up. Can you hear me now? Oh, yeah, I can hear you, yeah. Um, I'm just wondering, you might have <laughs> and I don't mind, I really don't. <laughs> Thanks, hello. Um, <laughs> uh, I wonder, you just mentioned the, that there's no positive suicide. Yeah. Uh, and then when Ethan brought up suicide, you also mentioned that it, kind of in the way that he sees life, it doesn't really matter in the the sense of like eternity that yeah. I feel like that's kind of, well, to me anyways, in a certain way contradicting in the sense of if, if it's like, if time is infinite and nothing really necessarily matters and he's not really giving us, well, as far as I'm concerned, any good reason to live, I'm not pro-suicide, but I'm trying to understand um, why he's saying there's no such thing as a positive suicide if really like we are to live to feel despair and suffering and is that am I understanding him correctly um so the the way he understands positive suicide is by by trying to give some rational reason to ending your life you could say mm -hmm. um but then also there's the philosopher side of it where it's like we're trying to say, well, you know, isn't it, you know, isn't it sort of, doesn't make any sense, right? Like if, if, if somebody would try to commit suicide, it would be something innately positive or, or something positive about it. Um, but for Sharon, that his whole point is that, 
and, th and this is still an interesting argument that I'm still grappling with, is that uh, he's trying to say that the organic affliction towards this supersedes our own logic of trying to understand why would somebody want to kill themselves. It, he, he says it completely supersedes this. Um, and that to even say that it it would be an assertion of life for Sharon, it's, he, he would say then you're not really dealing with the organic fear of death. There's, there's nothing about death that you should feel okay with. <laughs> that, that, that's what Sharon is saying, ironically enough. There's nothing that you should feel okay with. Um, it, it's not like this uh, Platonist idea of, you know, the good man, the good man doesn't need to fear death. Um, for Sharon, there is only fear of death and that sort of fear of nothingness. And yet there's like a sort of pathological attraction I, I, um, I completely under sorry, I need to cut you off. No, yeah, good. I completely understand that, but death is completely inevitable. So him having a fear of death seems like I mean it's practically the same as living. There's nothing we can do about the fact that we're alive, and there's nothing we can do about the fact that we will eventually die. So what does he expect to get from this? Uh, nothing. <laughs> so okay. so um, I, that, that is his whole point, I, ironically enough. He's, okay. this is what um, Nietzsche meant with, you know, writing with blood and, and sort of confessing. Um, I look at Sharon, I mean, I would say this. I definitely don't look at Sharon as sort of an applicable thinker that you can just um, make it the motto of your life. Um, it would actually seem completely against what Sharon is talking about. Mm -hmm. And yes, Sharon is completely contradictory. I, I completely agree with you. But what's funny about him in a sort of dark humorous way is that he just doesn't care. <laughs> like it's it was it was fascinating reading him because um he's so aphoristic and you can look at multiple passages where you're just like, okay, he contradicts himself there, he contradicts himself there. Um even though he says forgetfulness is the only salvation he ironically says well a woman is a temporary salvation <laughs> <laughs> okay yeah okay i understand thank you <laughs> yeah. is there any other questions um yeah <laughs> yeah okay um what would he have to say about something like euthanasia where someone would that be seen as a rational explanation for someone wanting to end their life if someone had a disorder, an illness, or mental illness, so debilitating that their life was actually more suffering than the, than the you know, than the thought of nothingness? Would that be a rational explanation? So you're talking about euthanasia? Yeah. Okay. That is rational if someone's life is too painful to continue to be. Yeah, I mean, I mean, I, I know I have my own thoughts on this, but like, yeah, for Sharon, it would seem that the idea that you would want to sort of come to this conclusion of, I, I need this sort of method or the methodological idea of euthanasia is, is I would bet it would be a, a rational explanation for like, I can't live this life anymore. Um, you know, I, I must end it or, you know, I have this illness and I can't take it anymore. And it's just better if I go. Um, and so for him, I mean, he's, you could do, you could do either, either, or if you want, he's not going to care, <laughs> but his own personal take is that even if you rationalize euthanasia, right. Um, for him, it still doesn't justify it still doesn't justify it at all. All, all you're doing is sort of uh, rationally explaining why you should do it. It still doesn't justify why suffering is there, why it exists. And so he's he's talking about how suffering at its very core just makes no sense. <laughs> it, it makes no sense at all. Um, and so he's 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 struggling with this. But I guess maybe that's the point too. With at least in the first book, with uh, Heights of Despair, is that we have to sort of fall down this abstract realm into organic affliction and start understanding that at the core of reality, at least for Sharon, it's irrational. It's completely irrational. 
And it's mysterious. It doesn't make any sense. Um, and just like you're pointing out, right, or somebody else pointed out earlier, it's like, well, you're going to die anyways, right? It's, it's a difference between dying a little bit sooner and then your eventual death. Um, and yet for Sharon, it's like, yeah, it, it still doesn't make any sense. If you're going to die anyways, then it's irrational from the beginning. So that means even the explanations to give and, and say that we need this method is irrational. Would he stop it from existing? No, I don't think so. <laughs> Is there any other questions? I'll jump in. I'm, I'm struggling with the uh, purification. So I'm oh, kind yeah. of, maybe I'm stuck in a contradiction or his contradictions, but it seems as if some of the quotes that you said was that the spear is required for ecstasy. So that, that mm -hmm. makes a lot of sense to me that in order to peak in ecstasy, you must understand the other extreme. But then in another sentence, it's kind of like you're saying, well, it all just doesn't matter anyway. So does it matter? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> no, no, that's, no, that's exactly what I love about him. Um, no, that's a good question. Yeah, he. this was something I was struggling with too, because remember, I'm trying to break him down and sort of give it like tangible food pieces to you guys. And he just sort of just, gives you like a paragraph about it and then he just drops it he doesn't he doesn't expand on it anymore um you'd have to keep looking to see maybe if he expands upon it maybe he doesn't um but you're right this question between you have to experience despair first and then ecstasy um but then not to mention also he from the beginning he also says that oh yeah both of these are forms of purification and i'm sitting there and i'm like well i don't even know what that means um, the only thing that I can understand with purification, because he talks about ash, ashes a lot, sort of burning, uh, the sort of burning on the inside because he's being metaphorical here, um, is this purification is the, the sort of heading towards nothingness um, or the inevitable nothingness of reality. Um, but the ecstasy part, that's the one I'm still trying to figure out exactly how that's a purification. The only thing that I could think of is that sort of biological reference that scientists make when uh, you have like a sort of high dose of oxytocin right before you die. It's like a super high dose right before you die. Um, so it makes it pleasurable <laughs> right before death. Mm -hmm. um, so that's my only speculation about how those forms are a sort of purification to meeting the nothingness of, of reality. Hopefully that answers your question. Um, very good. <laughs> I see a lot of people got. Uh, I like all the questions on suicide though, because that was that was stuff that I uh, struggled with um, personally when reading him, because uh, I thought it was it was fascinating in the sense that he's giving this sort of a rational argument. Um, is there is there any other contradictions that <laughs> we want to talk about? Because there's definitely a lot. <laughs> uh, I'll put something else to point on. Um, I don't really have a question, but I guess it's just the way I'm wrapping my head around this kind of approach to understanding death. It's this. It's like so. Oh my goodness. Um, yeah. Uh, like Emil's way of kind of rationalizing this is that, you know, there's nothing to be gained from dying. So there's no point in pursuing it, especially if it's inevitable anyway. So it's like, why end your life prematurely if, you know, if everyone is going to die regardless of what they do, then like you might as well stick around until it happens. Mm -hmm. So, so you're trying to say like you're trying to say like what's his point of even saying like any any of this if it's you know if he's also dismissing the uh, what's the point of dying now then later is that what I'm understanding? I think that's kind of the goal of what he's trying to say. Yeah. Yeah. There. 
so keep in mind the the heights of despair um he wrote when he was like 22 years old right super super angsty super into nietzsche um but also there's themes that he sort of stays with throughout and from a betting man i would say that he doesn't change a lot of a lot of these original concepts too much um mainly because he sort of stays he still continues to not be uh, systematic um completely anti-systematic the whole time um but I, I think that the contradictions that you're pointing out between he he's he's very much a YOLO uh, type of guy for some reason in, in this Heights of Despair book. Um, he's like, yeah, it doesn't matter. But but then there's like a double negation going on, even if you say it doesn't matter, right? So if, if we're getting fixated on that nothing matters, then Sharon would say, then say that again, nothing matters to my nothing matters. And then you are, you live this sort of ironic life or sort of living dead life um, where he's sort of sick of death. Now, that's the part that was fascinating to me was sort of exactly what you were pointing out, um, that he says all these things, um, that nothing matters, and then yet he finds himself sick of death. Yeah. Um, and, and that's something that I'm still trying to wrap my head around mainly because he's trying to say that this is something organically experienced and organically felt. And it, it does put into question this idea of, of thinking for Sharon and how if we're not thinking from our organic afflictions, then he's just not interested and maybe some of these sort of irrational and contradictory thoughts is is precisely because sharon is an insomniac <laughs> and depressive he's he's depressed all the time um and so it, it seems like even the his own confessions about death and eternity and what's the point of all of this um and and sort of the complete absurdity of it all um, is just really a more a, a confession of his own thoughts rather than um, a sort of logical grappling, if that makes any sense. Like uh, there's a sort of deep irony with just reading him and trying to explain him because I, I'm already like doing the thing that I that he doesn't want me to do, which is try to make sense of him <laughs> um, because he's just it's 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 deeply rational for him the the, the sadness and is all a mystery it's all sacred and so there is some accusations of him being a sort of gnostic in a way and and i think susan sontag even described him as um carrying a sort of a, a dualism of, of of platonism yeah but i also hope that answers your question yeah absolutely All right. Is there any other questions? Because <laughs> now I know it seems pointless now. <laughs> <laughs> it seems pointless now, right? <laughs> uh, uh, I had a question about um, eternity experienced as an instant. So, um, uh, so I can. So if I am to understand correctly, um, he basically says that when we die, kind of similar, um, uh, similar uh, position to the Epicureans, where you are, death isn't, where death is, you aren't, that sort of thing. So um, are there, would he say that there are any experiences in life where you, where you can be said to actually experience eternity yep I, I i mean that that is that is the really good one um it's mainly because he only gives us just a couple of clues about this and this is why i'm, I'm still struggling with him um this idea of experiencing eternity actually still doesn't make uh 
any sense in the way that he's talking about it, other than the fact that through agony, you sort of an illness, you discover death's imminence. Um, the, the only way I could possibly explain that conclusion that he's coming up with is when you are in a sort of organic affliction, when you're sort of actually physically ill, everything, nothing, it, it doesn't actually feel like a sort of successive moment. It just feels like one very long moment. <laughs> um, and so if I, if I was to bet, I would say that that experience of eternity, that sort of rupture and that sort of transfiguration, because he does talk about it being a sort of transfiguration. Um, ironically, I do think if you want to tie it to like psychoanalysis, I would almost say like there is a sort of this leap into sort of destructive plasticity with the experience of eternity as a sort of being a rupture and ironically also a transfiguration. Um, now, if it is a transfiguration, every time you do this leap or this have this experience of eternity, um, then it's always going to be just an instant, a, a sort of instant that completely annihilates itself from any other moment. But and I know I'm not even really answering the question because I don't even know myself what that would actually mean um, in this way. Because it's like I'm not, I'm not in the sort of state maybe <laughs> that I'm just like the lucky one, I guess, for for Sharon, where I don't have the organic affliction that he's talking about. I don't have insomnia like he does, and and maybe the product of what he's saying is exactly. The product of what he is, meaning that insomnia must feel like an eternity for him, a complete rupture from everything else. He's always walking around, never sleeping. It wouldn't even be a kind of temporal succession for him, especially if you are uh, that chronic of an insomniac. So in my opinion, a lot of what he's saying, and I know I've already said this before, um, is that he seems to be the product of his thoughts are the products of his own affliction, I would say, which makes it even more difficult to understand because we're not Sharon. <laughs> we don't have this organic affliction, even though he's making, you could say, universal claims about how we can. Um, so I think he sort of leaves it up to us, in my opinion, about whether we think it's actually possible, whether we think it's actually true. Um, I think there's room to argue for it, but again, arguing for it seems so silly, um, especially when you're talking about Sharon. It, it seems to make very little sense about why should I argue um, or prove that you can experience eternity um, through the way that Sharon is talking about. And so th those are the, some of the conceptual thinking that just sort of falls into void um, as we're trying to think Sharon and, and what he wants to say and then when we get caught up in his thought, like I did so many times, I realize that it's it's really his symptom, his his despair, his um, sort of unfolding agony that he he can't bear, and yet he's also sick of death at the same time. Um, but yeah, hopefully that know. sort of fleshes that out a little bit more. <laughs> Maybe doesn't answer it completely. <laughs> I'm going to start quoting this guy next time I get it too vague. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I I hate to reduce him to like a sort of a cliche of, you know, you only live once, but uh, there is a couple of uh, aphorisms where he says, you know, if you're going to die anyways, then why are you sort of refraining from your ecstasy and enjoyment, you know, you, as if as if the people striving for morality are any different from you when it all ends in sort of uh, this nothingness. So there, there is, there's argument for that, <laughs> that he has this kind of YOLO attitude um, towards life, but he is coming from this background of Nietzsche and this angsty uh, young self that he is. <laughs> all right, is there any other questions?
We actually have five more minutes. So maybe I'll ask Julie. Maybe I'll ask the last question is, um, how is it, why do we uh, decide like to read Choran, but I find it impossible to teach him? Like I love him, reading him, but I hate, I'm not able to teach. Do you know why? <laughs> this is why. <laughs> Yeah, that that <laughs> so that that's what I that's what I struggled with the most is that it, it it seems so silly to me to be like, oh man, let me let me teach them and then yet I decided I'm gonna try to do it anyways. <laughs> <laughs> um I guess I really do line up with Eugene Thacker on this where it, um Sharon is just that type of thinker that you just stumble upon him. It doesn't make any sense for us to read him because we want to understand something. Um, it doesn't even make a sense to be like, yes, uh, you know, let me get to the root of everything he's saying. Um, and then yet he has this very romantic sort of pathetic prose about death that makes no sense. Um, and everything's absurd and everything's exhausted. Um, he talks about how boredom is how philosophers always kept trying to solve boredom. And he's like, he actually thinks boredom is the rupture of time and where it reveals that time is illusion. Time is an illusion. Um, so yeah, going, going back to your question, Julie, about, you know, why is it, why should we bother with this thinker? And is it, you know, why is it impossible to teach him? Um, yeah, I don't know. I think it's, I think it's probably the most, a ridiculous thing to do and obviously Sharon wouldn't care uh <laughs> I guess he wouldn't care either way um this is where he kind of lines up with Kierkegaard except he's a sort of faithless Kierkegaard either or um it, you're doomed anyways um but I think the attempt to teach him is ironically worth it maybe <laughs> maybe maybe the point is to get sick of Sharon um, like the way Sharon gets sick of death and attempt to teach him and talk about him and make it, uh, attempt to make it systematic. Uh, and that would be uh, the ironic trueness to his principles. <laughs> uh, but yeah. Yeah, like at least some significant proportion, proportion of this lecture is about impossibility, it's teaching about impossibility of teaching Sharon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. That's exactly right. Anyone else with questions? No? Nothing. All right, then. Uh, thank you, Javier. Yeah, thank you guys. I have to be here. So I stopped. I will let you go and I will contact you. Okay. All right. Thanks. Bye. All right. Bye. 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 Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.